in my practice, something that I frequently hear is I don't have time to be depressed, right? Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, we don't necessarily take time to check in with ourselves because we are productive and in the outside world, we look like we're thriving, right? Black doesn't crack, but internally, we're dying. My name is Yasmin Jamila and I'm the founder of Transparent Black Girl. My name is Andrea, I'm a registered nurse and I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Access Project New York Harlem. My name is Ashonda Brown and I am a culture and entertainment expert and editor. Hi, my name is Dr. LaShawn Paul and I am the owner of Social Work Diva. I'm a mental health therapist and consultant. My name is Amaka Gradia. I'm a psychiatric nurse practitioner and mental health consultant. My mental health journey started with my family. I have family members who have struggled with it. That's where my interest peaked from. Um, and then I kind of fell into it earlier on in my career. So with that, I tried to kind of take some other routes, but ultimately I realized it was um, the, it, it's what felt right. My mental health journey started in college. I was starting therapy. I was experiencing a lot of depression and anxiety at school. Uh, the complete opposite of what most people think college is, right? This like fun time. Uh, and when I started therapy, I felt like my life just got better immediately. And in tandem with that, I was sharing a lot online as like a blogger in that space almost like 10 years ago at this point. And from there, I, I started just seeing a response of other black women resonating with me. And I felt like I really needed to do something about it, something bigger than just sharing about myself. And so then that's how, how I started my first, world, first wellness brand. My mental health journey started in seventh grade. Um, I actually was waiting around in the doctor's office and seeing like Jeopardy and <laughs> <laughs> then Wheel of Fortune come on. And I was a bit annoyed since I had like a 3.30 appointment. <laughs> and my doctor asked, um, I remember I had a thyroid disorder at that time, and my doctor asked like, how long do you wanna live? And I was so much a 12 and a half year old. <laughs> and I was like, I don't care. And he thought that I was suicidal, which I wasn't at the time. But what he did was refer me to a therapist and I, he was like, do you wanna go see a psychiatrist or something? I was like, sure, why not, right? Mm -hmm. um, mainly because I saw it on TV and I thought like it was affluent and nice to have a psychiatrist. And then I went to the, a therapist without really having the need, but actually really enjoyed it. Later on, I got into mental health mainly because my friend during my senior year of high school um, died by suicide. Mm -hmm. And it was when I knew that I wanted to help black girls and women um, be live stigma free, but also prevent mental illness. So my mental health journey started a little bit later than everybody else's. Mine actually started during the pandemic after going through 76 interviews trying to find clinical placement as a registered nurse. And to face that amount of rejection, not understanding why my qualifications didn't get me the job was the impact like to take me out. I'm this strong, independent, like fierce person who was doing so much. I was Miss Wilshire, New York, 2015. I had a platform and I'm still being denied. I'm an A plus student. I am a 4.0 GPA. I have all of these extracurriculars. I am what the golden package is for most Ivy League colleges. And graduating the way that I did and not, and then facing that type of rejection knocks you off this totem pole. And then the statistics that are out there that tell you that you're not gonna be anything as a black woman or as a disabled person, you're supposed to stay home and eat bonbons and everybody's supposed to be waiting on you or you're too busy being sick trying to take care of yourself so you're not good for placement was all I saw and all I knew. And I knew that then my life wasn't worth it. And if that's all that messaging was gonna be feeding to me, why is it that so many people were okay with assisted suicide and not okay with my presence? My mental health journey is very much aligned with y'all too. When I was in college, I was very much the student that was like involved in a lot of clubs and I was always getting A's and passing everything. But it's like, there was something that was just like in my head that just like wasn't clicking. It's kind of like my mind and my body just weren't aligned, but I didn't know what it was. And it wasn't until after I graduated college where I was trying to find a job and I was applying to everything, but I kept getting like no after no after no. And it made no sense to me because I was like, I'm so qualified, I'm an A plus student, like I have all these internships, why wasn't I getting anything? And then post-graduation depression, which is a real thing, started to, started to really settle in and I tried to take my own life. But my, my cousin who stopped me, she called my father and my father who worked for the Federal Bureau of Prisons, he, he had access to what I think is called EAP, 
Um, and he said that he wanted to get me a therapist ASAP, so that's exactly what he did. And I've been in therapy since I was like about 21 off and on, um, but I realized that like because I'm a writer and because I'm an editor, I do have a platform and I have a voice where people trust me. So I do whatever I can now to marry whatever I'm talking to, whether it's a celebrity or a bodega owner or whatever about their mental health and wellness journey. Because at the end of the day, like, you know, I bleed blood just like anybody else. I'm sad just like anybody else. And I experience emotions just like the next person. Black women just being black and a woman. And then when you add in other different social determinants of health, mm -hmm. right, they are more likely to need mental health treatment, but less likely to seek it, right? And a lot of that plays into like the strong black woman schema and the syndrome and all those things that ultimately create and reinforce a stigma, right? And I think that when you kind of think of the two A's in regards to access and awareness, what's really important is that there isn't enough funding. Therapy is very expensive. But also a big part of it too is there aren't enough providers that look like us, right? In my practice, something that I frequently hear is I don't have time to be depressed, right? Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, we don't necessarily take time to check in with ourselves because we are productive and in the outside world we look like we're thriving, right? Black doesn't crack, but internally we're dying. I think that's so impactful to say, especially when you're coming from Brooklyn, where we have Little Caribbean right here and 90% of the community that we're around is our immigrants. So they come here and they're like, you should not be complaining because you have every single opportunity mm -hmm. laid out for you. Mm -hmm. So now your family is also enforcing this strong black woman um, syndrome that we have to like uphold the family. You better have that good career because if you're not making ends meet and you're still living at home with your mom and dad, are you even successful? Now, let me add disability in there. Am I even successful at 36 if I just moved out two months ago? What does society say about me? And then you lift this world up on your shoulders trying to say that you're good. And like I said before, you're just duct taping yourself to all of your responsibilities, never giving yourself time to breathe. So then everything just crushes you in. And that just, it's overpowering. Like at some point or another, you're either on that list of saying, I can't handle this anymore and life is not worth it. Or you're on the list of saying, I need to do better and you're gonna seek help. But then when you're trying to seek that help, you're not finding anything that looks like you or it's too expensive. And then you're right back into, I just need to suck it up. Mm. Like I will, I will be 1,010% transparent. I didn't know that a lot of people thought the same way that I did about mental health until I really started telling my story on social media and being honest with people like, hey, I used to suffer from suicidal ideations. Hey, I used to cut myself. Hey, I used to feel A, B, and C. And then there was this sense of community, but it also made me a little bit sad because when, it, when I think back to my mother or my grandmother or my aunt, they didn't have people around them having conversations like this. And it makes me, it makes me kind of like, disheartened that we're just having these conversations now in 2023 about mental health and it makes me think like damn if my mom had these resources or if she knew that she had access to some of this stuff where would she have been as a mother where would she have been as a wife where would she have been as a professional just as a human being because a lot of the things that are passed down to us or are not passed down to us are because of lack of resources. Therapy changed the trajectory of my life. I would not be sitting in this seat if, if it were not for therapy. It allowed for me to think about my life, think about what I wanted, what I didn't want. And it just really affirmed who I am now and, and made me know that it was okay to have that as consistently as support. And I don't look at therapy as something that you should do only when you're in turmoil. Mm -hmm. I think it's something that you do like when you're going to, to the doctor, right? If you're having a checkup, if you're doing great, if your health is really good, then no, you're not gonna go see your doctor as much. But if you just sprain your ankle, you're gonna be going a lot more, right? Mm -hmm. And so I look at therapy like that and as a muscle that we should work and that it's, it's important and it's not something that represents weakness. For so many of us, that's what we're taught. But I think the strongest thing that I ever did was, was go to therapy and I'm so proud of my younger self because that step literally got me here and I would, I would not be who I am if it weren't for going to therapy. And I think that therapy doesn't only teach you a lot about you know, your own mental health and wellness, but it teaches you a lot about like how you, how you interact with other people in day-to-day -day life. Like I realize I suck at communication, which is really backwards because I'm a journalist and I'm somebody that talks to people every day. But I find myself even in therapy like clamming up or shutting down when something comes up that I'm not comfortable with, but it does teach me those interpersonal skills. It teaches me to hold myself accountable. A myth I would like to debunk is that um, there's nothing wrong with you if you're taking mental health medication. Um, within my field that I work, I prescribe meds regularly. 
Um, and with some clients, they really are in a space of feeling like they're a failure or there's something really wrong with them if they have to take meds. Um, and taking meds for depression is akin to taking a pain relief for a headache, you know? Um, and everyone has meds that work best for them. It might take one, two, three trials, but ultimately there is a regimen that most clients get to to where they feel like they are a new person, you know, that it's night and day. They can't believe that they are in the place that they are now compared to where they started with me in the beginning. A stigma that I would like to de debunk about mental health is that you need to have something wrong with you before you see a therapist and or feel that something is off, right? I think anyone can benefit from therapy, but also black women tend to see therapists when something's already wrong and it's exacerbated and it's mental illness. So I would love for more preventative work to happen in this space. So one of the myths I wanna de debunk, especially for my Caribbean immigrant black women, is that it's okay to find another person outside of your circle to talk to that can get you on that track to whether it be medication, whether that just be internalizing like you you are okay and you, you will be fine and that we're gonna get you to that place and not having to worry about leaning on friends or family. Like having someone else on the outside to listen to your problems is, is a world of wealth sometimes that we don't tap into because our culture is to say, be quiet, keep your head down and keep and keep in alignment. Mm -hmm. And Caribbean culture, especially because we're immigrants and we have to uphold this stigma to, to the world that we have left behind so forth. Like that's how it's portrayed in the Caribbean world that we've left the home that we knew and we have to always look back and, and show them that we can be this strong person and the strong person can't be in therapy that strong person needs to be in therapy because that strong person is grappling with things that even just women who were born here do not understand. That is a different household and you are okay if you talk to someone that is a counselor. You are okay if you talk to someone that's in mental health because your family is gonna tell you no. They will tell you don't do it. They will tell you that you are crazy for doing it. You're not, you need it, go get it. I'd like to dispel the myth that there is this, this optimal level of healing that you reach and that you'll no longer need therapy mm -hmm. after that, right? Um, again, you don't always have to go at the frequency that you are if you're in turmoil and crisis, but it's okay to have a relationship with a therapist on a long-term basis. I, I think as you're navigating different points throughout your life, that therapy is a tool that's needed to check in with someone. So whether it's multiple times a year or whether it's bi-weekly or whatever it looks like for you, that it is okay. Healing is not linear. Wellness is not linear. Mental health is not linear. And so we have to be gracious with ourselves and not feel like there's this optimal level of healing and perfection that you'll reach that you no longer need that support. Um, because especially as black women, um, we need community. We need support. We need sustainable systems that can help us. And therapy is one of those. So the myth that I want to debunk in mental health is ageism. I feel like oftentimes when we're kids, especially like in black households, people say, oh, when you're a kid, just go to church, just go to Sunday school, just pray it away, just drink some tea, drink some ginger ale, you'll be fine. Oh, you don't go through anything. You just go to school. Like how serious can school be when the child can be getting bullied? The, per the person can be sexually abused and you don't know. The person can have a lot of internal demons that they're fighting. So I want to debunk the fact that children like, Age and mental health isn't something that's separate. Like, you can be 72, you can be 12. Like, it doesn't matter. Everybody experiences it. 